Ta-da, there we go. Sorry about that, guys. All right, welcome to another PM Square live stream. I'm your host today, Vice President of Technology, Ryan Dolly. And we're really excited for today's live stream because we are releasing a new version of the Cogbox. So this will be the 2021.1 release. And it's got a lot of really cool stuff in it. So um, we're, we, the, the only way to get the cog box, so it's, it's officially releasing on March 1st, okay? Between now and then, the only way to get it is to have attended this live stream. Um, and the way you will be able to do that is with the link that I am going to paste into chat right now. So if you want to download this uh, to kind of follow along with us, uh, you should be able to do that. So here you go. There's the link in chat. And that is going to allow you to download this version. Like I said, it's not going to be live for everybody else until March 1st. But for those of you who attended this live stream, you have access to it starting today. So um, we're really excited for this. I'm going to loop Paul in in a second. We've done a lot of work to make sure that we can have Paul live on camera and that things sh should go smoothly. And before I do that, um, I'll take a quick roll call. I see we've got a lot of our regulars here. So um, Pat in Chicago, Sonia, of course, from Canada. Scott, good to see you again. Jonathan, hello. Mark McDaniel, always a pleasure, sir. Um, yeah, Lisa from Toronto. How you doing, Lisa? Hello from the Netherlands again. Yeah, it's nice to see you. All right, so uh, this release, you uh, if you're curious about what's in it, we had a blog post just go live, which you should be able to check out. So let me just make sure that it's there. And there you go. Um, I'll paste this into the chat as well. So if you want to go and read a synopsis of, of what's in this, um, you can go ahead and check out the, the blog, the Introducing Cogbox 2021.1 blog. Okay. Why are we so excited to show you this today? Uh, because one, it's super cool. And two, it includes, it solves what we think are some major headaches with the, the usage of data modules in particular, uh, but it also really gives you some very nice features that you can use to help enhance interactivity reports of reports and make reports more usable for your end users. Very powerful development tools that you're gonna see. I think probably the most powerful development tool we've ever, we've ever made or ever, ever released in, in the Cogbox is gonna be included in this. So. With that said, you all know I'm just the hype man, right? Um, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and loop in my good friend Paul Mendelssohn, Cognos Paul, and we'll we'll take it from there. So, Paul, can you hear me? I can hear you, Ryan. How are you? Doing great. Um, yeah. So, how are things over in Israel? Uh, things are going very well. Um... I do have a small test problem in the background there, <laughs> but things are doing very well here. Great. Awesome. So um, I think, you know, there's if there's a theme to this release of the Cogbox, it's, it's all about making your life as a Cognos developer easier. That's, that's the big uh, part of it, I would say. The, the main thing we're looking to accomplish with this release. And so we've got a lot of really cool stuff to show. So let's just jump into it. The first thing I'm going to want to show here is a feature related to data modules. So let me go ahead and, and I'll build a data module real quickly. Zoom in a little bit uh, so that you guys can see. So I'll make a really simple data module out of the Go, our trusty Go Sales database here. And we'll grab that. And just to keep it nice and simple for you, I'm going to go ahead and take order details and order header and pull them into this model. So this is something that is pretty common in data modules at this point where let's imagine this were an operational database we were dealing with and we wanted to make a uh, sales fact out of these two tables. Well, what would you do? Well, it'd be pretty common. You know, you'd come over here and you'd say, okay, order details and you're going to join it to order header on order number. Let's go ahead and swap those guys. Um, one to one. There we go. Match those columns. Looks good. Okay. 
so you're tooling around um, and you might come in and you, you say, okay, I've got these joined together. Now I want to, I don't want to present these as separate tables to the end user. I want it to look like the sales facts. So how do you go about doing that in Cognos? Well, you would go to the custom tables and say, okay, I'm going to create a custom table. That's out of these two tables. We'll create a view of tables. And maybe we'll call this sales fact and finish. So now Cognos is very helpful in this way. It brings me to the custom tables view and I can see order header, order details flow into sales fact. And you know, the best practice at this point might be, okay, I hide order details and order header so the end user can't see them and stuff like that. Um, but a very common problem that I've had, Paul, I know you've had, a lot of our consultants have had, some of you may know my dad is a Cognos guy. He, he recently called me and was like, Ryan, how do I fix this? Is what happens when you want to swap one of these tables out, okay? In out-of-the-box Cognos, you can't. You have to redo this whole process. You have to redo any calculations that flow out of it. All the downstream impacts that, that flow off of this sales tape, fact table are going to have to be redone. And it can be a major pain. I don't know, Paul, have you run into this situation? I have run into this situation many, many times. Yeah. That's... And yeah, before I wrote this, I would actually open, uh, use the cheat to get to the specs, copy it into Notepad, make the changes, then paste it back in, and then redo that a few times because I broke something. Exactly. And that, that was the only way to really solve this problem. Manually rebuild it or try to mess around with the, the data module spec until you can get it to do what you want. So what we've done in this release of Cogbox, I'm very, very excited to share, is we have made it very simple to solve this problem. So I'm gonna create a new table here. Um, it's a new order date details table. Now, let's just, I'm copying it obviously, but we're gonna imagine that this is actually a different table from the database. So the request comes in, hey, we were using order details table A, now we need to use order details table B, right? We wanna swap that into our model. Well, what we're gonna do here, let me just give this uh, new names here. Let's just make it clear to you what's happening. So this is order details B, and I'll go ahead and rename the identifier to order details B as well to make that clear. Okay, so we've got our order details table. Now we have the order details B table. If I click on the cog box icon in the corner here, you will see that we have a new thing called the query editor. And the query editor is pure magic. This is the thing, <laughs> when Paul told me that he had found this out, I was, I mean, I was, I was literally sitting at my desk fist, uh, fist pumping when he had figured out how to do this. So when you open the query editor, you're gonna see it's gonna show you the queries that you have in your model. So they're all listed here, the, both the name of the query, the identifier of the query, um, what type of, of uh, query it is. So in this case, you know, uh, your tables, the things that come straight out of the database will show up here as table. And then you'll get different values here depending on the type of custom table you've created. So in this case, it says query. If I had built it, say, a joined uh, table, instead of a view of tables, it would say joined here. Um, so you can see all of that. And what can you do in this view? Well, one cool thing you can do, uh, probably the most powerful thing, is to solve the problem I just outlined. So I can see my sales fact is made up of order details and order header. I want it to be made up of order details um, or order, order header and order detail B, right? So I'll click here. It brings me into a new screen where I can simply click on order details, switch it to order details B, click finish. Now there are other things I could do in here. If I wanted to add additional tables into the view, I could do that, right? I don't in this case, but I could. Um, but in this case, I'll click finish. You can see here now order details B and order header are, are my tables. And looking at my custom tables view, here's the proof. I now have order header and order details B rather than the base order details table. So this rate, one thing right here, when you run into this situation, will save you 
potentially hours worth of work to, to rebuild all the downstream impacts of this or to go through and try to understand, the, try to decode the data module report spec in the way Paul has to be able to manually make these edits. Now you can simply come in here um, and make the changes on your own. So this is something I love and I wanna personally thank you, Paul, for doing this. Um, I don't, I did it for me. I'll be honest. <laughs> I was getting so frustrated with this. I, I did it for me. Yeah. And Paul, that's, that's a good point. I mean, how much of this stuff yeah. that we put into the cog box, is that the origin story of a lot of these features is like, you get tired of banging your head into the wall. And so you go uh, out and, and solve it on your own for yourself. The query editor, the source of that, if you open that again, uh, yep. the, you'll notice the sorting icons on the right. Yep. And Sonia um, was having an issue where she had to import some very, very, very wide tables on the magnitude of 400 fields each and manually sorting them was killing her. So I wrote this really quick for her and then I started using data modules and discovered certain things that I wanted to improve. So I added them here and yeah, you can click on sort, uh, sending, descending or by magic. Yep. Uh, yeah. That's the and section the you see that. here. So what Paul's talking about the, the origin of this was originally just what you see here. And it, it, it may be a little hard to see cause it's grayed out, but excuse me, if you look at order details B, you can see it's not really in any order here, okay? So that's the, one of the other feature of the query editor is I can go ahead and sort order details B um, in ascending order. Ooh, that's not good. No, that's new. <laughs> okay, bug, Oops. fine, I will fix that later. Huh, that's interesting. That's that has literally never once happened. In any case, um, mm -hmm. It will normally sort them in uh, ascending order, descending order, or um, uh, what magic. we call magic order, which goes what? Identifier, uh, Identifier attribute, fact? Attribute, uh, fact, uh, folder, filter. Yeah. Identify so, so it's an auto sort button. Now, the one caveat, and you actually just saw it in action, right? Um, the one caveat with the with this feature, and you the, you'll if you go to our the blog, you'll see it right there, and I'll quote from the blog. It's important to note that actions taken using the query editor cannot be undone. So we don't have access to the the what do you call it, Paul? The undo stack or something like that? The undo stack. Yeah. Yeah. yeah why don't you explain that to people? Yeah. So. Every time you take an action inside data modules, it adds that action and the current state of the model to the undo stack. And if you change an identifier, move something around, it takes a snapshot of the model and then puts that into the stack. And so if you undo, it'll very quickly uh, put the state of the model as it was before. I have not been able to figure out how to tap into that. So any changes that you make, you can't undo unless you close and reopen the data module from scratch. Right. So that gets into, I mean, a very important point. You really shouldn't be working from the production model anyway, um, and you should be saving your work as you go. But it is a very important to know when you make a change with a query editor, the undo button will not undo that change. So that's the only caveat with that tool. Now, why exactly it just bombed out when I tried to do that, I don't know. We'll fix that after the live stream and um, and uh, and make sure that that you're all aware uh, when the fix is in place. I have I've honestly never seen. I've used this a ton, and I, I've never uh, I've seen that happen before. And yeah, I see I see Mark's question: Is this part of the free Cogbox? Yes, that is a free feature. Um, so that is available. To the those of you who chose to attend today, that that is a, a feature that's available to you now. Okay, um, the other thing that we wanted to show uh, was the copy parameters feature. This is another one of those things that is just the coolest darn thing. I love it so much, and I think um, it would be good to 
if if Paul, uh, if you want to walk us through this one, why don't you go ahead and request the ability to control my mouse, and then um, we'll take it from there. All right. Okay, so what this allows you to do is it lets you, where do we have it? Cognitive products, and then base report has a number of saved parameters associated with it. So if I take a look at this, uh, what is it, report, and current values, three prompt values. So we see that country has Canada, Austria, Belgium, and Brazil selected. Now, I have a few views of this report, and I want to copy the selected parameters to all of those views. Or I might have other reports, and I want to co uh, copy those parameters to all of the reports, just so everything is consistent. So I can copy it. You know what? I don't want Canada. I want England. Click OK. And now I'm going to select a few reports few report views, rather. I'm going to go paste parameters. England, Austria, Belgium, Brazil. I don't need to paste in name or region, so I'm going to unselect those. Click OK. And the report view has been updated with the selected parameters. And just to keep me honest, those there it is. Properties. Report. Three prompt values. England, Aust Austria, Belgium, Brazil. Um, it's still including region and name simply because it detects those parameters in the report. Yep. Uh, eventually, I'm going to add more features like removing or adding rows, uh, both to the parameter values and to uh, the parameters themselves. So you could include a parameter that doesn't technically exist in the report. Um, I can think of a few reasons why you would need to do that, but those are really esoteric reasons. Um, and yeah, it's something that I'm very proud to have created and I'm going to be improving uh, as time goes on. And this is one of those things I know um, is a real pain. And, and depending on how you're deploying Cognos Analytics, some customers, say, aren't using views at all, and every report is its own unique object. And for them, you know, this is interesting, but it may not be that powerful. Other customers I have are really in a situation in which they are, um, in which they are using a ton of, of report views. Like I, I have at least two customers I can think of where the actual report objects are not visible to end users at all. All end users see are report views and they see uh, a ton of them. And there's a lot of, di you know, just report view management becomes very challenging. And then setting the parameters across those report views becomes very challenging in which um, there may be you know, you've got a, a base report and then you've got a hundred report views off of it and you just want to make a single change where, hey, instead of referencing 2020, now we want the prompt to reference 2021 or something like that, right? Now you can do that in bulk uh, across all of the reports that share that parameter. So this is a massive time saver uh, for, for some customers out there. I know I've talked to a number of people who, who really... We're excited about this functionality when we shared it with them in the preview stage, and I'm happy to finally be able to bring it into the, the production Cogbox product. I see Scott asking what version of Cognos does this work with. Um, so we test on 11.17. I don't know, Paul, if you have any thoughts on what, would it work on an 11.0 release or one of the earlier releases of 11.17? I'm going to say we haven't tested it on any of them, so it's a use at your own risk. I think it might the underlying uh, APIs that I'm using, I don't think have changed much um, since even the Cognos 10 days. And there's a new GUI on this, but it's still the same basic underlying functionality. Yeah. 
Um, I suspect it would work, but I'm not going to promise anything. <laughs> Smart words. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's uh, officially tested on 11.1.7. Um, if you are trying on a an earlier release, obviously I would say the further back in time you go, probably the less likely it is to work. Um, but we we're not testing on on earlier versions. For those of you who who maybe don't know, 11.1.7 is the long term support release for Cognos uh, for the 11.1 release stream. So if you're not on that version, I would say there's a lot of great functionality in that version, so you should get to it as soon as possible. But the other reason to get to it is because it's going to be a supported release for years to come. So it's, you know, when bug fixes continue to roll into 11.1, the 11.1 release stream, that's where they're going to roll in. If you're on 11.1.5, you're not going to get them, right? You're going to, you're going to have to go to 11.1.7 to get them. So I would get on to 11.1.7 uh, as soon as I could. Were I you. Okay. Um, more reason to upgrade. Exactly, Chris. <laughs> I still occasionally talk to customers who are on Cognos 10. Um, it's not, you know, it's it's gotten less common over the last year, I would say. Uh, maybe a year ago, there was still a decent number of people out there on Cognos 10. It's definitely getting rarer, but, but they're still out there. Um, so, okay. Any final words on that feature, Paul? No, I okay. think that's pretty much it for now. All right, so um, that is also a free feature. So that is available in the the public, the free Cogbox free release uh, that that is available today. All right, what else do we have here? So now we're going to transition from uh, what we we kind of sometimes refer to as tricks, right? Those are kind of things that enhance the Cognos UI, the Cognos modeling experience, report developing experience. Um, they're, they're generally accessed through the, the Cogbox menu that you see throughout the environment. So whenever you click on the Cogbox menu, you kind of see the tricks that are available in the, U, the user interface that you're using. Um, the second thing that we have are, of course, custom controls, right? And these are, these are this is really where Paul's uh, Cognos wizardry shines. Um, and what we're going to be looking at from this point forward are custom controls that are available uh, in this Cogbox release. Now, not all of these things going forward are in the free version. So I will make sure to call out what is and what is not um, because, of, of course, that'll be something you want to know. Now, we have this report that we call um, that we call the fancy report uh, at, at PM Square, and it's something that, like, as we develop new utilities, new custom controls, new ways to visualize things, this is where we, we kind of put them all in the fancy report. It keeps getting fancier over time. So let's take a look at the fancy report here and, um, and uh, start to walk through some of the new features in this release of the Cogbox. And one thing, you know, if, if anybody from IBM is watching, one thing that would be great for us is if we could please uh, get licensing permission to just put this on, on the public web so that people can see what cool stuff can be built with Cognos. That's my request for you guys. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to point out here, there's really three features that we're going to talk about, okay? One is um, the export to PDF and Excel buttons. Those are part of the free release. The second thing we're going to talk about, or, or rather, uh, the first thing we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about it immediately because actually one of the features is on the screen right now, uh, is something called Perform Actions. Perform Actions is by far the most powerful thing, it, enhancement to Cognos we have ever made. Uh, by far. Um, and then the final thing we're going to talk about is a new export to PowerPoint that will allow you to take reports and really, in a fine-tuned way, create a single-click export to PowerPoint that is just going to blow your socks off. But first, we're going to talk about Perform Action because you'll notice that there's an alert at the top of the screen. It's using the Cognos alerting system, and yet it's alerting me about something that's contained in the data. It's telling me the following product lines are below target, golf equipment, mountaineering equipment, and outdoor protection. And you can see on the Fancy Report dashboard that indeed golf equipment, mountaineering equipment, and outdoor protection uh, are below, their, the um, sales are below their target. This is something that can be done with perform actions. 
So what Perform Action does, and I'm going to do my best to give you a high-level overview of it and then hand it off to Paul, is basically Perform Action allows you to um, step in when certain things happen in Cognos and perform an action. For example, when a report runs for the first time, an end user clicks the button, the report starts running, you can jump in at that point and start manipulating things like prompt values or what's displayed on the screen, you know, based on params in the report or data that may be being pulled, things like that. Likewise, when, a, when an end user submits a prompt, you can then step in and based on the prompt value, change how things are displayed on the screen. Um, or, you know, if, if someone selects param A, then, so, then, you know, set the same value in params B and C, that sort of thing. Um, it allows you to really be targeted to jump in when Cognos is doing something and say, hey, Cognos, hold up a second. Before you finish, I would like you to carry out these commands first. So that's the best. I, I mean, this is all comes out of Paul's brain. Like I said earlier, I'm the hype man. So that's the best I can explain it. Paul, why don't you uh, take over for there and show off a little bit of it? All right. I'm going to uh, request control again. Okay. And I'm actually going to go to a different report that I made. Uh, called, because I'm the one that comes up with all these really great names, um, I called my report Perform Actions Example. Up one. So let's, up there one. you go. <laughs> I blame Zoom. The lag is terrible. Let's edit the report and take a look at what it has. So in here, I've got four examples. The Perform action script can be set to run instantly as soon as the report runs. Uh, and that's done with start on load true. We can also have it create a button. Notice in this case, the UI type is none. Well, I can also do UI with event propagation. And I'm using font awesome. So we have the icon of a dragon for this one. In addition, I can attach it to an existing prompt. So in this case, let's take a look at what we're doing. I'm attaching it to the country select control. I'm setting a variable called country variable that has the value from the country select prompt. And then I'm setting another prompt, action one, action two. I'm setting a prompt the country's text prompt with the value from inside the country var variable. And let's run it and take a look at what we get. So when it loads, we should immediately get an alert. Form action scripts can be set to instantly run. We see the icon of that dragon. We click on it and it alerts this text item. And I'm going to select Canada. So it saves the value into a variable and then uses that to populate this text prompt. And finally, this one, we can show and hide text items based on a prompt or even a button. This toggles it. And all of these are stackable. So let's take a look at this one. This one saves the value from set display, uh, saves the value of the prompt name uh, into this variable. Then I'm going to the block uh, I'm going to a block named block, actually, and I'm setting it to whatever is in the variable set display. And then I'm getting the prompt values from prompt name. I didn't need to do this. Uh, I could have just used the old variable, and I'm alerting it. And this alert I'm setting as alert type success. Uh, when you're... Anything that takes text, if you're setting a prompt value, if you're alerting something, there's a huge 
range of items that you could use. So I could make the message use static text and then a value from a prompt. Oops, that should be closing the array. So what it will do is it will show a success alert with the word static text and show or hide based on what's selected. Um, and as I said, everything is stackable. So you could have an action that goes through a dozen different prompts, setting them in, in a specific way. One thing that I like to do with this is uh, clearing existing prompts. So you, I might have a dozen different prompts on the page. I can just use this to loop through them and clear them all or set them back to whatever, whatever default values I want. Um, in one of our clients, we use it to auto submit a prompt page. So with one script, we go to a number of hidden prompts, set, uh, set the default values, and then the final action would be type report action. And then the action is finish. I think that's it. And then once it's finished, it'll submit the report. I, I have a lot of plans for changes to this. The next thing that I'm looking into is adding conditional statements. And I'll, so you would be able to say, if the, this value is equal to ABC, do this list of actions. And then, of course, you'd be able to put another conditional statement inside that list of actions as well. So there's a lot of things that I'm looking forward to doing in here. And if we go back to the fancy report, close it and open in uh, Report Studio, just to show how it works. Zoom. Zoom is being very laggy. Edit report. Yeah, it looks very fancy in the front end when you run it, but in Report Studio, it's a lot of stuff going on in here. Um, that's because you are not showing hidden objects. Visual aids, show hidden objects. There we go. So I'm using the perform actions. As soon as this block loads, it will alert the following product lines are below target. And this is a repeater that simply returns all the bad product lines. And it's sitting inside a block that will only render if there are bad product lines. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to throw it back to you, Ryan. Sure. Okay. So how does that? How does this actually manifest itself? Just to um, to show you guys uh, again to make sure that <clears throat> you have an understanding of what's going on here. And thank you, Paul, for that walkthrough. This, so this this is a this is not a free feature. This is a Cogbox Premium feature, and and so you can see here, right? It's setting this alert up top. Now, if I go to the filter icons and I change, you know, months to uh, December 2012 and region to uh, Asia Pack, I get this this notification that says, "Hey, you selected Asia Pack, right?" That's being done with uh, the perform action custom control. Now click finish here. You'll notice it's gonna run again. So the port runs and I get uh, another a series of alerts. So this one said the following product lines are off target, right? Letting me know which, which, which ones are off. 
There was also an alert that said, um, for questions, contact Tom, right? So it knew that because I went to Asia Pac, that if there was, you know, Tom, when you go to, if you have questions about Asia Pacific, the financial analyst you should talk to is Tom. And so when you, when you search for, when you do a prompt for Asia Pacific, it proactively let, lets you know that, hey, if you have any questions about what you're seeing here, the guy to call is Tom. If you look for a prompt for the Americas, maybe the person to call is uh, Susan, okay? So it's interpreting the prompt you've put in and then uh, firing off a, uh, an alert based on that. And then finally, this reset prompts button, if I say, okay, I just want to go back to the original state of these things, this is also a perform action custom control where it'll take me back to July 2013 with no region selected, which is the default view of this report. So these are the types of things that, that you can do with this. Um, and it, you know, all this and more uh, really <laughs> can be done uh, with this, um, with, with uh, Perform Actions Custom Control. It's really a very powerful thing to have in your toolkit as a Cognos developer. Now, I'm sure as you saw when Paul was going through it, you know, there is a little bit you need to know to make it work. Paul has written a very good uh, kind of uh, user guide documentation in order to kind of walk you through it. And then obviously, if this were something you were interested in purchasing, you know, we would, we would have some enablement hours uh, set aside for you to get you up and running with it. Okay, so that covers the uh, perform actions. The next two things we're gonna look at, this, this next one I'll show you is, is quick, and this is part of the free release. And that is the um, PDF and Excel buttons. So these are buttons you can put onto a report that will uh, do the that will create um, PDF or Excel outputs for you just by clicking. So obviously we all know you can run as and and generate those things. But where this really comes into play is one, you know, it's easier to just have this button with the icon than clicking here and choosing run PDF. And the other thing is that as we are increasingly living in a mobile world, that interactivity, it's just not good to, tell, to try to tell people to, to interact with that in a mobile device, right? What you want to tell them to do, like, is, you know, all you want, if you're doing mobile, all you want someone to be able to see is the stuff that's in here. You don't want them interacting with sidebars, top bars, none of that stuff. And so in that case, if you want them to be able to export it to a PDF, you're going to need to have a button on the screen that they can tap with their finger. And that's what this gives you. Um, so you can see here, if I'm going to click the PDF button, I should probably add an indicator to let people know it's yeah. actually running. Yeah, this yeah. one takes a second. Um, theoretically. If you get a million uh, downloads, I will laugh at you. I probably will. It's curious that it's taking so long. Now I'm actually concerned that uh, let's do manage hmm. administration console. Uh, try the Excel. Yeah, they're Should both. Be neither of them are working. I'll close out and open it back up. We'll try again. Dang it. You know, we tested all this stuff in uh, pre-production like 30 minutes before we went live and they all worked fine. It's very funny that suddenly yeah. these buttons are not functioning. Okay. Well, they generate a uh, PDF and an Excel file for you just by clicking on it rather than having the choose run as. That's free. Another thing to show on here is the email functionality. So you see we have an email button and that opens up this email window. So I can say, uh, Sonny asks if my pop-up pop block, uh, well, it's not blocking anything, but let's take the shields down and see if that has any impact on it. Doesn't appear to. Okay. So um, I can go into emails and you see it's it because this slide out window. So I can say, okay, I want to email a uh, PDF and it's going to say, yo, check out this PDF, man. And I'll send that to um, myself. And Paul, I'll CC Paul. 
there's Paul. And by uh, the way, I just tested this, and I'm getting both the Excel and the PDF very quickly. Are you really? This yep. could be something in my browser. I could switch over to a different browser and oh, show it. Look, next to the plus, do you see the little download with the X button? What's that? Ah, it was okay. My browser was blocking it. All right, we'll show mm. that in a second. Um, so, <laughs> PDF and Excel, right? I want to send PDF uh, to myself. I'm going to CC Paul. And uh, I could put anyone else in here. Does any, would anybody like to receive a PDF uh, right now? If so, put your, uh, your email in chat, and, and I'll add you to this, uh, the two value here. I'll just wait 10 seconds for that. Yeah, it's interesting, Paul. So a lot of times I use the Brave browser, which is a Chromium browser, but it's got a lot of like privacy features built in. And um, I don't know why it suddenly started to decide to block the downloads from this site because I've done this a hundred times. I mean, literally a hundred times and it never has. Um, so it just started to. Maybe because you were clicking so often, uh, yeah. you tested it before and you went from PDF to Excel quickly and it detected it as- Yeah, like downloads. too many simultaneous downloads. Okay, so let's go ahead and send this. Success, the report has been emailed. And let's pop open my Outlook and just take a look at what's going on in there. So I just got it. So here you go. I use dark theme, which obviously makes this look a little funky. But as you can see, all of the visualizations are included in the body of the email itself. Here's the message I put in it, right? Yo, check out this PDF, man. The PDF has been attached. So I can open the PDF, and here's the report in PDF form. The visualizations in the body of an email, the message that I associated with it. So this is a, you know, a very powerful version of kind of the sharing functionality that we have in Cognos. Um, and again, Instead of interacting with a menu, you can put a button on the screen and have your end user interact with that, uh, which is just something I, I love that we have here. You can also uh, set it to just email to the user himself without having to enter any prompts or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. So like you could set it to default email to yourself. Like if you click that, if I click that button, it will automatically email whatever I'm looking at to me. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. I didn't even know that. Um, you can also hard code uh, to CC or BCC emails. So if someone sends an email, you can have it automatically uh, go into a like an email repository just to make sure that whatever is being sent is correct. Cool. All right. So and that... you can also have it email a different report if you wanted to. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, so it's it's really a very powerful little email button. Now that uh, is also a um, premium uh, feature. I think the final feature we have to show today, um, oh, let's take a look at these real quick now that I have that turned off. So if I click the Excel button, is it actually going to, there we go. See, fancy report one, I click save, I open it, and here's my, data in Excel. Same thing, I click the uh, PDF button and it says, okay, your PDF's ready, you wanna save it, I'll go ahead and save it. Here's the report in PDF format. Uh, it, it's also worth mentioning that you can control the name of the PDF. So in this case, it's fancy report dash username dash today's date. Yeah. Yeah, so that's all configurable. What do you want the PDF to, to be named? Now, um, Sanish wants to know, are these buttons available for dashboards? Uh, no, not yet. I've been running into some issues trying to get certain dashboard objects to appear correctly. Um, it, it's not something that I've uh, had a lot of success with. Um, there is a new dashboard API that I have not looked into much. Um, it's on my list of things to do. 
uh, and I'm hoping to get to it eventually. <laughs> yeah, dashboards, you know, just in general, I mean, it, it seems to me that creating customizations for dashboards uh, that does does th that do this level of manipulation of what's happening in Cognos is maybe a little more challenging than it is in reporting. Would you say that's accurate, Paul? That is very accurate. Yeah. And I also have a reporting background, so I understand what Cognos is doing in the in the background. And yeah, dashboards yep. are still matter. I mean, probably more than anyone on earth, I would say you understand that. So, <laughs> um, okay. So I think the, the last thing we want to show here, and, and this is another premium feature, is the um, export to PowerPoint. So I know this is something that people have been asking for a lot. Uh, is, you know, there's the Cognos for Office plugin that is like frozen in time from 2009, maybe. Um, does it even still work? I don't know. If you're watching and you still use that, I'm curious what your experience with it is like. I, I haven't touched it in at least five uh, years, but I believe it's still uh, supported. My current client uses it a lot. In yeah. fact, I just finished writing a hundred page, hundred slide report using it. And it is very, very, very painful. Yeah. So what we have for you here to give you access to PowerPoint is uh, a button. And you'll see when I press this button, I get a little thing. Your PowerPoint is loading. Okay. Fancy report PowerPoint is ready. It's got the name and the date. Again, this is configurable. What do you want it to be called? The file, um, that's configurable. I'll go ahead and save that. And now I'm gonna open it. And you can see what we've done here is really a lot. And this is all configurable on, on your end. So how do you want it to paginate? I guess it's not paginating, but how do you want it to divide up the slides? What goes on each slide? Is there a logo? Is there a title card? All of that stuff is configurable in the utility. You can say I have a title card. We've put our logo in the upper right-hand corner. And now what I've done is, or what Paul's done rather, <laughs> is, uh, is each uh, product line has its own slide. So you'll notice the differences between the display here is really pretty significant. Like, uh, Compare the PowerPoint. So each slide, camping equipment, has the comparison bar chart. It has the uh, trend line chart. And then it has a detail table broken out by product line, OK? And then broken out by regions. Compare that to what's actually on my screen. I don't have the line chart on the screen right now. It's not visible. The only way to see the line chart is to click on this button up in the corner. Now I can see the line chart. And of course, the table is not visible in, in the report at all. So what the PowerPoint's doing here is it's not just taking a picture of, of what you can see on the screen and dumping it into a PowerPoint. It's actually interpreting the Cognos report, dividing the slides up based on the data in the report, and adding elements that are not even visible in the report but that I, as an author, know someone who's exporting a PowerPoint is going to want to see. So this is another one of those things. I, I say it often, I think, in these live streams, like Paul shows me something and I go, Pow! and this was one of those where I was like, man, that is just incredible. So uh, this, of course, is not as... This takes some setup, right? setting up. You have you, you have to tell it, okay, like I here's how I want you to divide the slides, and here's what I want included on the slides, right? So, you know, it, it does take a little bit of setup, but you can give your end users a one-touch PowerPoint experience like this to take a Cognos report and, and get it into this. And the thing that really floored me, and I don't think Paul even told me this, I think I noticed it on my own, was when I was looking at this and I was like, wait a second, where is this table coming from? right? <laughs> it's not even in the darn report. I mean, obviously it is in the report, but it's not visible in the report, yet we're including it in the, the PowerPoint export. And I, I just love that. So I don't know, Paul, if you want to just do a brief uh, overview of like how this is actually set up so that people can see that. Absolutely. Sure. So the, uh, I'm going to request control again. Okay. There we go. Okay, and let's uh, come on. Close this and open it in reports to view. Yeah, 
or reporting or whatever it's called. Authoring. I, I don't know what to call it Authoring. anymore either. If there's anybody from IBM Facebook. watching, can you please share what we're officially supposed to call it? Because it's been five years and nobody knows. I am old and I will continue to call it Report Studio. I st it's, it's, it's Report Studio in my heart. Yeah. Okay. And here it is. Generate. Authoring. Okay. It's officially authoring, Paul. Okay. Uh, Zoom is lagging terribly for me. Can you go to the control, please? Yeah. Where is it? Uh, oh, it's right above. There it is. Okay. Click on that. Okay. And then over here. And yeah, the configuration. Yep. So here you go. So I don't know if you want to try. All right. So this is going to be fun. Um, there are a few plate things uh, in here. Let's move this all the way to the top. This moves up to here. And then expand it all the way. OK. So I've added, ah, did I do that? Zoom is killing me. <laughs> All right. From the top, we have the file name. And that can be, again, static text. We can take the date. We can also take the username, the report name. Um, we can take prompt values or parameter values and put that in here as well. I'm going to skip the slides for just a moment. We have the master slide objects, and this is what will appear in the background. So we have that rectangle uh, that's just hanging out on the left side of the screen. And then we have the PM Square logo on the right side. Um, so how the X, Y, width, and height are all uh, these are all in inches. And if you edit the PowerPoint and you go into the uh, layout of each object, it'll be exactly what you have here. So the rectangle is 0 0.12 inches wide, 0 0.77 inches tall, and it's on the left side and 0 0.15 inches from the top. And same idea with the image. And because this is the master slide object or the master slide definition, this will appear in every single slide that you create. Um, as with everything else that I'm running, this is still under construction. I am eventually going to make it so you can define multiple master slides, um, which is why when you start looking at the individual slides, you can actually reference the master slide the name of which master slide you want. Um, so every slide is defined individually. So we have the title for the product line slides. Then we have the product line slides. Now it's important to note here that the data table, the bar chart, and the line chart are all repeating because they're inside a repeater. And my script is smart enough to recognize that the these objects are repeated multiple times. So it's going to actually repeat each of these. It's going to make a slide for each one of those. For each multiple, it's going to take the data table and place it here. It's going to take this graph, place it there, and align it nicely. Uh, finally, we also have a text item that appears. Uh, so exported by username uh, and date. We have various text items that appear in the uh, PowerPoint. And you can see that we have a lot of different options. Um, we can define the color, the font size, the font type, 
Um, one thing that I just added that I didn't have time to uh, add to the PowerPoint, um, you can also include shapes anywhere on the page. Uh, so I was going to add a highest performing product in a little star. Uh, didn't have time to add that, unfortunately. Um, so we have one slide for the title of the product lines, one slide for the product lines, and then again, title slide for regions. Uh, it is a little complex when you first look at it. Uh, I will admit that. But once you start getting used to actually making the PowerPoints, it starts making sense. Um, the client that the first client that we have that's uh, that's using this, I think we've got something like five or six reports uh, using this control right now, and everyone is very very happy with it. Um, and I think the, I think that's a, a good point, Paul. Is that in order to really give you the ability to have just you click a single, all the user has to do is click a single button. And they're going to get a highly formatted PowerPoint that looks exactly the way you, the author, want it to look. You know, we got to give you a lot of control, right? And so yeah. you you have control to make it look exactly the way you want to look. That being said, if you want to be super lazy, you can be. If you just pull in the PowerPoint generator with no configuration, it's going to make a slide for every single data container that you have. Yeah. So it'll be one slide for the table, one slide for the graph, one slide for the other graph, and so on and so forth. Uh, and maybe that's an interesting way to learn one to, to use this, is to like I, run it first and see what it does. And then, OK, well, how can I get it yeah. to combine these two onto one slide and go from there? Um, there is one important thing to note, that it only works on objects that are on the page. So if you have a multiple page report, you can't pull objects from the from one page into the PowerPoint that you have on another page. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned before that I'm still using the old uh, uh, plugin for Microsoft Office, and that's simply because the required PowerPoint is something like 100 slides. So I wasn't able to put it all into one page in the Cognos report, unfortunately. Yeah. And you should, it should be clear, when you say one page, you mean like the page object in the report, right? So it's like, it, right. if, even if you can't see it, if it's on the page object, well, then it's available. Exactly. So that data table is actually sitting right here. Right. Never and displayed in the report. The, uh, it's sitting inside a block that's set to display none dash block. Yep. So it's still being rendered. It's just invisible to the user. Yep. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. I see some, uh, some good questions and great reactions in the chat. Um, Bruno wants to know, is the data in the PowerPoint table editable? Um, yeah, it's creating a table in the in the PowerPoint, so you could still edit it. Yeah, so let's um, take a quick gander at that, and you can see here. I don't know, Paul. This just looks like an image to me. Uh, no, it's it's a table. Should be a table. Also, you can't edit it because you haven't clicked on enable editing. Yeah, I'm a goofball. There we go. <laughs> so now you can see, right, August 2012, uh, August 2014. Mm -hmm. Editable. The, uh, the graphs are images. Right. Cool. Yeah, very nice feature that you have here, and and our, you know we we've deployed this at at least one client, and it's been extremely successful. So, all right. Well, if I'm not mistaken, Paul, that wraps up all the features for this release of the Cogbox. Is there anything we've forgotten? I can't think of anything. 
Great. Um, yeah, I have my homework. Uh, I have to figure out why uh, why the sorting broke the data module. Yeah. Uh, I blame the live stream. I blame but, it too. Uh, yeah, we'll figure that out. Awesome. Well, I want to. Uh, we'll go ahead. If there aren't any further questions, uh, we'll go ahead and um, wrap things up there. Let me just. I'm going to paste the link in the chat one more time where you can download this version of the Cogbox. Now, as a reminder, this link is only available through the live stream chat. So you, it's not live on our website. If you were to like Google it, uh, you're not going to find it, right? You're going to need the link. I pasted it in at the beginning of the live stream and paste it in just now in order to download it. Um, and I think with that, you know, we can go ahead and wrap things up today. I want to uh, take a moment really to, to thank you, Paul, for, for putting all this stuff together um, and, and making it available. You know, I, I don't know if I've told this story on stream before. I know I've told it to a lot of people. But when I was in 2015, when I decided I wanted to, to move from the customer side of the house to the consulting side of the house, I was looking for um, which, which IBM partner I would go to. And... I, PM Square wasn't the only one I was talking to. There were a lot of other good partners out there, but you know, I had kind of known Paul through his blog for a long time, and we had communicated via email a little bit. And and uh, when Paul told me that he was going to PM Square, I said, "Okay, well then that's the side. That's where I'm going. I'm going to PM Square. If, if Paul's going to be there, then that's where I want to be." And here we are, six years later. And that has really borne out, right? <laughs> where Paul went is where I wanted to be. And uh, it was really, it, I think the stuff you've put in the Cogbox is just so incredible and extends the, the usefulness of Cognos for developers so, so much. So I think on behalf of everybody, I just want, I want to thank you for making this available to everyone. It's, it's really my pleasure. I've always had the philosophy that the easier Cognos is for everyone to use, the more people will want to use it and the more opportunities I will have to work with Cognos. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's all selfish, really. <laughs> well, I think it's worked, Paul. Uh, it definitely, you're an in-demand person, that's for sure. All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll wrap things up there. I want to thank you all for coming, uh, and once again to these sessions. I, I hope it was valuable for you. Um, I know I have a lot of fun doing them. Keep your eyes peeled. We're going to schedule a few more. I think we're probably going to take a week or two off, and then we'll have some upcoming sessions scheduled. I think we're going to do one on enterprise data module management. So you're a big company. You've got big company needs. What can data modules do for you? I would expect that in the next couple of weeks. And then after that, we'll probably be looking at maybe taking a peek at the IBM GitHub integration that's available and uh, how you can use that in your environment. So stay tuned to pmsquare.com slash events where you can see what we have upcoming. And uh, until then, I want you all to uh, thank you for showing up today. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe out there, and we'll see you next time for another PM Square live stream. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.